Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is awesome, a great king over all 
the earth. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. Well, good morning. This morning, we are thrilled to welcome the Day Spring Chorale from North Point Christian Schools in Grand Rapids, directed by Lisa Spangler. In the spring, Chorale sings in church services around the Grand Rapids area, and we're so excited to welcome them to Holland today, especially on Daylight Saving Sunday. <laughs> I did my student teaching semester at North Point last year, and I had the privilege of working with these students both musically and spiritually. They have a ton to offer as a musical ensemble, but I thought, so do we. Several of the songs that they are singing are familiar to our Christ Memorial musicians, and so we put together a joint service using our many resources that we have here for worship. In addition to their normal high school choir activities, Corral is also embarking on a mission trip to Jamaica in a couple weeks. If you're interested in learning more about Corral or looking for ways to support, um, you can visit Lisa at Kiosk 3 after the service. This group has had a major impact on my life, and I hope that they will also for you. So please join us as we enter into worship. We're going to start with um, a couple songs that Corral is joining us on. Um, oh, announcements. I'm sorry. In today's Contemporary Christian Life Issues class, Dr. John A. Birnbaum returns to share the challenges facing U.S. foreign policy right now, and CCLI meets at 1050 in the chapel. And you're also invited to pause each day during Lent with the devotional Pauses for Lent. Um, you can pick up a copy at the Information Center or in the church office. More information on that can be found in your bulletin. So please enjoy um, this worship service this morning. Across the great divide, help me. 
Our next piece is called Death Was Arrested. We've sung Death Was Arrested as a congregation once before, but we're learning it um, as we'll do it on our Easter service. So I invite you to sit back and take these words in. The words will be on the screen um, if you would like to sing along in your seats.
Will you stand and greet each other?
to these words from the book that we love, found in Philippians chapter 2. Who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. And being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, he became obedient unto death, even the death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Would you stand with me, please, as we sing about his majesty. Sing with us now. Majesty. Worship his majesty.
Thank you, choir orchestra. At this time, I'd like to call our kids forward. Kids, you don't have to sit today. We can just stand. This is going to be quick. And while they're coming forward, I'd like to remind us why we do children's blessings. Jesus tells his people to let the children come to him, and he poses consequences for those who hinder children from coming. He also told his disciples, unless you can become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Our children here are special at CMC, but they are also very important in advancing God's kingdom. Hi, friends. Parents or kids, if you're new here, feel welcome to walk with us back to the children's area so that we can get your child checked in. Good morning, Billy. Hi, Evelyn, Evelyn, Eli, Andrew, Luke, Zamaya, Levi. All the landings. Hi, bud. I can, yes, I can give you a hand. Here you go. All right. You ready for the blessing? Ready. Ready. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord give you peace. May the Lord give you peace.
Thank you, Corral. Thank you for being here. We are so grateful to have you with us worshiping God this morning. Thank you. And now, brothers and sisters, let us continue worship in prayer. From Psalm 130, Lord God, out of the depths we cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear our voices. Let your ears be attentive to our cries for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you, there's forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. We wait for you, Lord. Our whole being waits. And in your word, we put our hope. We wait for you, Lord, more than watchmen wait for the morning. In the darkness, we have been wandering, Lord, lost in our sin, lost in our disobedience, waiting for the morning. We are to love you and love our neighbors as ourselves. How can we love you when we treat our neighbors with contempt? When we disagree with one another, and we will. Lord, guide us to disagree with love in our hearts as brothers and sisters and an earnest seeking to understand. Let us never forget that we are all sinners united together by our faith alone in the grace alone of Christ alone. This morning, Lord, we give thanks to you for Dayspring Chorale, how glorious it is to sing your praises with them. We give you thanks for 90 years with Eileen Wesseldyke. We ask for your healing mercies on Bob Ashley, Barb Dykema, and Jean Quanstrom, Carl Essenberg, Jody Heckman, and Mary Lubbers. We ask for your felt presence upon Teresa Lane, Dan Van Kirkhoff, John and Sharon Kleinhexel, and Will Daniels during their time of grief. We lift them all up by name to you, Lord, and pray that you will hold them close. In this Lenten season, search us, O Lord. Convict us of where we have gone wrong and how we can make it right. Then lead us, O Lord, to lift our hearts up in the joy of the greatest news ever told, that we are forgiven because of Christ and him risen. In his precious name we pray. Amen.
It was a dark and foggy morning. The morning was one that uh, we were traveling. We were going from London, Ontario, out west to Alberta, Canada. My wife's parents lived there, and we were going to spend some time with them. As we were traveling, we got to the airport, all five of us. Our girls were very small at the time. And you know it's a small airport when they tell you we're not flying today, the fog is too thick. Well, that kind of blew our plans. How are we going to accomplish our travels out west? And what they said is, don't worry about it because we're going to put you on a bus and we're going to take you down the highway and we're going to bring you to the Toronto airport and we should be able to get you there by time. So we tried. We got on the bus. I think this is not working this morning again. Something is not quite right there. Ah, there it is. Now we've got to go back. There was a man on the bus with us. We were traveling for two hours from the London, Ontario airport to the uh, Toronto airport. And it was one of those airport shuttles where the seats are around the outside edge. Our little family of five decided to go all the way to the back where we could spend time by ourselves, but we were invaded. Our territory was invaded by a tall man with a shocking white head of hair. He was distinguished in his dress and his mannerisms, and he sat just across from us. I was sitting here, my wife was sitting here, our youngest was sitting on her lap, our oldest was sitting next to me, and our middle daughter was always, as always, in the middle. And so we traveled, but I grew nervous because before we had gotten out of London, I was looking at the man who was not looking at me, but looking at our three blonde girls. And they were very young. And then he said something that made me nervous. He said, they make you fall in love all over again, don't they? Well, yes, me, but not you, okay? This is not something you want to hear from a strange man who's on a riding on a bus with you. So I tried to engage him in conversation and get his vision to go up to me rather than to stay on our young girls. That's when I found out that he was a doctor. He was a research physician. He was speaking at London, in London, Ontario at the University of Western Ontario because when he was a student in medical school, one of his friends uh, who became a doctor was now at the University of uh, Western Ontario Hospital. And uh, every year they continued their research. One would go to the other's place and then they would return the next year and go to the other place. And it was his year to come up to Canada and to be part of the uh, teaching team there for a little while. He was on his way back to Australia now. He said, uh, you know, he said, when I was going through university, I was busy. Then I got married. And then we went, I went to medical school, and my wife worked all those years to put me through medical school. He said, we had a family, several kids, but I truthfully have to say I had no part in it. She raised our girls and boys on their own. Uh, she was tremendous. Thing was, by the time our children finally finished uh, school, went off to university themselves, there was nothing left between her and me. For many years now, we had sort of lived separate lives. I was so invested in my work and my research in the hospital, and she was so invested in our home and the charities and things like that. I had even taken an apartment close to the university hospital in order to stay there because I was so busy. And she was looking after things well at home. And we had talked with the lawyer. We had it all worked out that when our last one left home, we were going to get the divorce. It was amicable. There was no tension between us. Neither of us had had an affair with somebody else. It's just the way it was. We had grown apart. Our oldest was a girl, he said, and she was married. And then she was pregnant. And then the call came that she had given birth. And I rushed to her hospital room. And when I got to the doorway, I saw that she was in the bed. And my wife was sitting in a chair next to the bed, holding our first grandchild clucking and cooing at her. 
And I stopped in the doorway. And I remembered what it was like for my wife to give birth to that woman in the bed, our first child. And I saw that baby, and I fell in love with my wife all over again. He said, we never did go through with the divorce. We are so madly, happily in love. We couldn't imagine being apart. And he looked at our girls again, and he said, they make you fall in love all over again, don't they? Yes, they do. This is the next message in your series from Exodus. And what we're doing really is falling in love with God all over again through the things that are taking place in the history of our world, in the history of our people. God made us to love, to live in love with one another. It is we who fall out of love. The Apostle Peter says, be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, like a roaring lion, walks around prowling, seeking whom he may, he may devour. And it's so true, and that's the pages of the early part of the Old Testament. That's our story. That's what's happening. How will God remedy that situation? We've looked at that for several weeks now. God chose to partner with a particular community, our ancestors, our spiritual ancestors, the family of Abraham, and to come and to live with them. And that's the part of the story that we're in right now with the Immerse Bible series. The book of Exodus, which has basically three parts. The focus is on that center section, the covenant, where God steps out of eternity and wraps his arms around us and makes covenant with us like a marriage agreement and says, you are mine. I love you. I will love you with an everlasting love. You are my people. Surrounding that, we have this opening section of Exodus where God fights with Pharaoh over who has claim to this bride of his. And then in this last section of the book of Exodus, we have the symbols. We looked at them a little bit last week. Remember that the last part of Exodus has three parts itself, the preparations for building God's house, and then this nasty story about the golden calf, and now we're looking at the very end of the book of Exodus where the house is made. The house itself is kind of a strange one. We have these words about it. Then Yahweh said to Moses, set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting on the last day of the first month, place the Ark of the Covenant law in it, and attend that the, at the Ark with, uh, uh, shield the Ark with the curtain. Bring in the tra a table and set it on what it belongs on it. Then bring in the lampstand and set it up on its lamps. Place the gold altar of incense in front of the Ark of Covenant law and put the curtain at the entrance to the tabernacle. Place the altar of burnt offering in front of the entrance to the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. Place the basin between the tent of the meeting and the altar and put water on it. Set up the courtyard. Put up the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard. Moses took the tablets of the covenant law and placed them in the ark, attached the poles to the ark, and put the atonement cover over it. Then he brought the ark into the tabernacle and hung the shielding curtain and shielded the ark of the covenant law as the Lord commanded him. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud that had settled on it and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of the Israelites, in the sight of the Israelites during all of their travels. Here's what it looked like. This church building is almost as magnificent. It's really not much to look at. This is what the CIA spy satellites picked up on those days. 
just a little tent out in the desert, not much of anything. Here's the floor plan, very impressive. One of the things I ask my students sometimes on tests is what were the six pieces of furniture in the tabernacle? That's all that's there. You've got more furniture in one room, in the entry to your house, than they had in the tabernacle. Six pieces. Notice what they were. Basically, it's a home for God, right? A home for God. And the entrance is on the east, and you come in by way of the gifts that you bring that are then placed on the altar for consuming by God. The priests who do the work wash their hands first. You had to do that when you were at home too, didn't you? And then if you want to symbolically show the people coming into the place where God has hospitality, there's the table all set up, ready for a meal. You have the lamp on because they didn't have electricity that far in the desert and the Aswan Dam had not yet been built. There's also an altar there called the altar of incense. Why? Some of you, I'm guessing not many, but some of you may have been raised on a farm. Sometimes on farms there are animals. And sometimes when there's butchering done, as we did on our farm in Minnesota, can still see my mom with the ax in her hand and the chicken that I had caught taking a block of wood and chopping the head off, and the chicken did not know yet that it was dead, so it ran around spurting blood. Those of you who grew up on a farm, you know this kind of thing. When you burn carcasses, certain parts of animals, they stink. And so there was an altar of incense on the inside of the, ta ta of the tent, the tabernacle, in order to bring a sweeter aroma. That's why there's two altars, one for burning the animals, one for covering the smell and making it smell nice. You do this too. You put flowers on the table. You have some smells in your house. And then there was the place of intimacy. It was the place called the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place. And that's where God was sitting on his throne. See, the Ark of the Covenant was not so much a shrine as it was a portable throne. Even had its own officers of heaven standing there over it, right? The cherubim. They weren't there to shield it as much as they were to guard the throne. But get this. The Ark of the Covenant, the top part of it, was a sheet of solid gold. And that may be kind of expensive, certainly it was and it is, but it had a name too. It was called the mercy seat, the mercy seat. This is where God sat on a throne ruling his people with law and mercy. This is the home of God. Three things I want you to think about this morning. One is that the footprint for the tabernacle was virtually identical to the tents that the Israelites traveled in. It's important to think about this because sometimes we think of the tabernacle and then the temple as these magnificent structures. Certainly Solomon's temple was a magnificent structure. But the intention was not to be gaudy especially with the tabernacle. It was essentially a tent like the Israelites themselves had. If you were an, in, an Israelite in those days and you were traveling with the rest of the company, what did you have? You had a fire out front and you sat around most of the time. This was your public space. And you gave greetings to those walking past your tent and you invited them for some food, and you sat there and you talked. This is your public space. 
When you have a few friends over, you step into your tent. And in the front part of your tent, you have the incense burning because it smells nice. You have some places that you can have some hospitality. You have some more food that you can feed. You have some candles to keep some, uh, the shadows at bay. That's what you have in your first part of your tent. And then when you want to spend time in intimacy with your family, you go into the back of the tent. And that's your space. This is exactly what the tabernacle was. It was God's tent. It was like the other tent, a little bigger maybe. Have a few more things that were, uh, you know, of significance and importance. But it was a tent like the others had too. Secondly, we have to think of the Ark of the Covenant as the portable throne of Yahweh. This is the place where Israel's king lives, reigns, and rules, like all of the great songs we've been singing all morning. Majesty, worship his majesty, and he is the king on the throne. Sometimes we think of the Ark of the Covenant as this kind of special shrine, almost like a magic genie's lamp. And if you write it, if you rub it the right way, and if you say the right incantations and make the right prayers, out pops God and says, okay, good, you did it right. What can I do for you today? And then God does for us, and then God pops back into his little genie lamp. Not so, not so. This is the royal throne. Sometimes in movies and Programs You see these royalty families of ancient times with their chairs, their thrones, sometimes shielded by some cloth, being carried through the crowds. This is kind of what it is. Yahweh is the king of these people, and this is Yahweh's throne. But notice that the seat of the throne is the mercy seat. And under that is the box that contains the summary of the covenant, Exodus 20 through 24. One more thing to think about, these two stone tablets, there were two of them, two stone tablets summarizing that covenant document, that bond between Yahweh and his people. It was placed under the throne. Can you imagine if in the White House, in the Oval Office, the president would sit on a chair and the base of the chair would have the Constitution, and everything that the president would do would be emerging from the Constitution, sometimes that sounds like a pretty good idea, doesn't it? This is the connection. This is the foundation. And here we have Yahweh, the king who rules in justice and mercy, ruling from a throne that is built upon the covenant the covenant between me and my people. Now, it's pretty important to think about that because there were two stone tablets. We know about this, don't we? Because we've seen it way so many times, too many times we know what's on these tablets, right? Etched on one are the first four commandments that speak of our relationship with God. Etched on the other are the last six commandments that on which are etched the relationship between ourselves and one another, right? Wrong! Let me say that again. Wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. It wasn't the Ten Commandments that were on here, but the entire covenant document. There was writing in the front and the back. The Ten Commandments are part of the covenant document. But it starts out, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the house of slavery, out of Egypt. And it goes on to spell out what is included when we follow through on the lifestyle of these Ten Commandments. The entire thing, as we know from ancient records, was on both. The whole thing on each tablet. Why two? Because you never make a covenant and write it down once. You always write it down twice. Why? Because no king, get this, no king lives with his people. 
What? No, the king of the Hittites lives over in Hatti, up in central Turkey today, makes a covenant with one of the city-states down there. They have a copy, he has a copy. And the copies are kept with the people so that they can read it every now and again and they're kept in the king's library. Two copies, always two copies, always two copies. And then you begin to sense the strangeness of what's taking place here. Yes, there are two copies. Each copy is complete. Each copy is full. Each copy is the whole covenant. And both copies are kept in the same spot. You know what this says? Yahweh is not an absentee landlord. Yahweh chooses to live with Yahweh's people. Where Yahweh goes, the people go. Where the people go, Yahweh goes. Two copies kept in the same spot. Extremely important. And this is the theme that will pervade the whole of the Bible, for the whole of the Bible has but one message. We are all the children of God. God made us in God's own image to live in love and service to one another and to this world in which we live. We are the ones who left home. We are the ones who broke relationship. We are the ones who forgot our parent. We are the ones living in the darkness. And because of that, God left home and became homeless with us to wander with us and bring us home. The Old Testament talks about the mission of God in terms of God's connection with Israel, coming to live with Israel so that the people of Israel might know him, might live with him, might live for him, and the nations around would say, wow, what's going on there? And in the New Testament, it turns out this way. When that didn't work entirely well, God had to step in personally in the person of Jesus. Think of the way that Matthew puts it in his gospel. You shall call his name what? Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Go figure. How does John put it? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him. There's nothing that's been made that has not been made by Him, and Him was light, and that light was the life of all humankind. He came to His own. His own didn't receive Him, but as many as received Him, He gave the power to become what? Children of God. And we beheld His glory. Glory is of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. And then what does John say? And the Word... was made flesh and tabernacled, tabernacled, tabernacled with us. Jesus, the tabernacle. Here's what it looked like. The camp resting at home with God. Here's how G.K. Chesterton put the whole story. There fared a mother driven forth out of an inn to Rome in a place where she was homeless. All men are at home. The crazy stable close at hand with shaking timber and shifting sand grew a stronger thing to abide and stand than the square stones of Rome. For men are homeless in their homes and strangers under the sun, and they lay their heads in a foreign land whenever day is done. Here we have battle and blazing eyes and chance and honor and high surprise, but our homes are under miraculous skies where the Yule tale was begun. A child in a foul stable where the beasts feed and foam, only where he was homeless. Are you and I at home? We have hands and that fashion and heads that know, but our hearts we lost how long ago in a place 
no charter ship can show under the sky's dome. The world is as wild as an old wives' tale and strange the plain things are. The earth is enough and the air is enough for our wonder and our war. But our rest is as far from the fire drake's swings and our peace is put in impossible things where clashed and thundered unthinkable wings round an incredible star. To an open house in the evening home shall all men come to an older place than Eden and a taller town than Rome, to the end of the way of the wandering star, to the things that cannot be and that are, to the place where God was homeless. And all men are at home. They tell a story in Ukraine years ago a decrepit, broken-down monastery. At one time, it had been a thriving place with hundreds of men living there in devotion, in prayer, in service, and all of that. There were only five men left in a much too large facility, and it was so broken down, and they were all old. The youngest was the abbot, and he was in his 70s. And the five men carried on, but they were cantankerous, grumbling, bitter old men, and nobody liked them. They didn't like one another. The abbot from the monastery on Friday afternoons just before Shabbat took a walk every week with the rabbi from the Jewish synagogue in town. They would commiserate together because the Jewish synagogue in town was getting older too and the people were kind of crotchety. And so the abbot and the rabbi would talk together about their common plight and the nastiness of humanity. One day when they got together, the rabbi was obviously agitated. He could hardly contain himself. He had to say something. I'm sorry, I gotta tell you this, I gotta tell you this. He said, last night the Holy One, blessed be his name, came to me and he said to me that I had to tell you something. Well, tell me. Well, the Holy One, blessed be his name, I don't understand this, the Holy One, blessed be his name, said, one of you at the monastery is Messiah. Well, that made no sense. Because the men at the monastery knew that Jesus had already come, Messiah had come. And certainly a Jewish rabbi was not going to tell them about that. And the Jewish rabbi did not believe that the men at the monastery were Messiah. So it was totally strange. When the abbot got back to the monastery, the men talked over supper about the things they had done during the day, always the same thing, but the abbot said, I got this strange story to tell you. Today I met with the abbot, as I, or with the, the rabbi, as I always do, and he said, last night, the Holy One, blessed be his name, came to him and said that one of us is Messiah. Can you figure that one out? And they all kind of looked big-eyed and then laughed and chuckled a little bit and then went on with their meager supper. That night, they all went to their cells for their times of prayer and their rest. And then they came together for breakfast the following morning. During the night, it had played on them. Pfft, crazy story, crazy story. But, 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 what if, what if one of them was Messiah? Who would it be? Could it be the abbot? After all, he was their leader. Eh, but he's not the oldest one among us. Could it be Brother John? I mean, he's a kind of a big oaf, strong as an ox, kind of dumb. But he'd give you the shirt off his back. Could, could it be Brother Elred? I mean, he hardly moves around. He's so old. He can't see anymore, but in the middle of the night when we're having our worship gatherings, he can sing every song without notes, without music in front of him. And he sounds like an angel. By the time they came together for breakfast, they were all the same men except that none of them was the same man. And things changed. 
Nobody ever said another word about it. Nobody ever said another word about it. But the people in town knew. They now wanted these old men who are not so grumpy anymore to come round. Because there was a kind of holiness that leaked off from them. And as they came through town, people smiled more and they deferred. And sometimes people would come out to the monastery on weekends and they'd pack lunches and they'd come and they'd invite one of the men to come over and sit with them for a glass of wine and some cheese just to be close to them. And they'd start talking about their needs and concerns and their joys and their sorrows. It felt good. They felt as if they were in a holy place. And then one night it happened. Two young men came to the door like long after lights out, long after it was dark, and they knocked on the door, and finally the abbot got to the door, and the two men said, we have heard about this place. We have heard in Russia that even here, God lives, Messiah lives, and we were wondering if we might join you, if we could become part of this community. And they did, and they were the first of many. They kept coming not because each one was able to identify who among the original five was Messiah, but because they knew in this place, in this place, God lived among humans. So many people came, they had to expand the boundaries of the monastery, rebuild the old buildings, create more space, open up space for newcomers. And when they built the arch over the new road that came in, they put up a sign there that had two words on it, Messiah's community. Messiah, Christ, same word, two languages, Christ's community, Memor memories of Christ, Christ Memorial, I see Jesus, I see Jesus, I see Jesus, I see Jesus. Do you? Pray with me. Give us, O oh Lord, your grace for the living of these days that we might know who we are and whose we are, and that we might see this in those around us. Amen.
Will you stand with me? As you go into the week ahead, know that your God goes with you. After I pronounce these words, the choir will echo them, and then you may give your amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord smile on you and give you his peace. Thank you.